Welcome to Public Affairs and Illinois Channel, a joint production. This show is going to be so good. Are you worried about the capital fund? $42 billion. Are you worried about the fiscal 20 budget? $42 billion. How much is in your wallet right now? $100? $10? Who wants it? The Democrats? The Republicans? Both? You're going to find out that and so much more. So don't change anything. And we're starting right out with Representative McDermott from Frankfurt. She is talking about the infrastructure, which, of course, is a major part of the capital fund. If we want to maintain our leadership as a transportation crossroads, and we've held that leadership since we became a state, then we have to step up now and invest in infrastructure for the future. Say, look, it's not just you. It's not just your intuition. This is real. The infrastructure is not what it should be. You are spending more time. Yes, it's not just a fable. There are actually more fatalities on the roads near us. And Jeff, that was the uh, McDermott talking, of course, about the Capitol bill. That's uh, one of the big issues, and it just broke on Friday afternoon when the governor finally announced the uh, amount of money that he was going to be spending on his Capitol bill. We've been hearing discussion of this for the last four or five months. Uh, senators have held hearings around the state to listen to all kinds of different groups to say, what's needed and of course we haven't had as a state a capital bill for the last 10 years the last capital bill came under governor quinn that was 31 billion dollars now 10 years later 41.5 billion dollars let's take a look This is the uh, pie chart that just came out on the uh, governor's bill and you, ladies and gentlemen you can see Transportation is going to be the major issue here. That's 69% of this Rebuild Illinois. That's the name, Rebuild Illinois. 69% goes to transportation. I'm going to round up a little bit and say that's $28.6 billion. 1% goes to broadband, but that's very, very important and something we talked to Ag Secretary John Sullivan about recently. And he was saying how much that's needed to get rural communities to have broadband. They can't attract the businesses they need or conduct businesses until they, um, they can get the, some secure broadband for their areas. So these are all things uh, where there's going to be over uh, six years, a lot of money going to various groups. And uh, Jeff, uh, so far... The Republicans have been more or less in agreement with the idea that we need an infrastructure bill. They may not be, we'll have to see if they're going to agree to uh, spending as much as $41 billion. And of course, that's going to come with uh, uh, a lot of different ways to raise money that heretofore uh, we've not had. Well, we're right, Terry. You've got the expenditures in that pie chart. People are probably asking, Where's it coming from? Where's the revenue coming from? You mentioned 41.5. I'll round off and say it's 42 billion. So 42 billion dollars, Terry. 18 billion dollars over the next six years are going to be bonds that are issued by the state of Illinois. 18 billion more than they might otherwise issue for other things. 10 billion in federal funds that I guess they would say are matching funds, so they don't cost Illinois anything. I guess seven billion dollars in state revenue, state revenue, annual revenue that's going to be sort of pay as you go. Seven billion in local revenue that's pay as you go. You add all that up, I'll round it off, Terry. Forty-two billion dollars. You said mostly transportation, sixty-nine percent. I'll round it off and call it seventy percent. You know, I'll round off the spending on transportation. 29 billion of the 42 billion is going to be transportation related. Okay. 6%, if I got that right, or 6 billion is going to be going to education, that is higher ed and K through 12 buildings. And then the rest shown sm smaller amounts in that. So that is a mammoth project, Terry. And I asked, I asked, uh, my good friend, your good friend, Mark Lennon at WirePoints, what he thought of this. And he said, well, there's an important point to make here. Here, this is a little different than when you're talking capital fund, unlike the regular budget, basic budget. 
you're talking swapping one asset for another. So somewhat surprising to me, sounded like Mark Lennon was a little bit favorable because he says you need infrastructure, you need these long-term assets. The problem, he said, the problem he said is there'll be a lot of pork because he doesn't think due diligence was done enough in terms of hearings to prepare for this. I know there were some hearings, I know there were some discussions around the state, but was there enough so we know, number one, if we're going to spend $42 billion, will it be spent properly? The other thing he said, the other thing Mark Lennon said is, where are the reforms? If you're going to spend $42 billion and you're swapping one asset for another, that's, well, if, that's yeah, good. $41.5 billion on the capital bill. Let's make sure that we don't confuse to... $41.5 oh, no, on capital bill, right. and then we got the nice. other budget that we're going to have to do. And uh, Right, but before we get to that, I said to Glennon, what reforms would you like? What's most important? And of course, he said, constitutional amendment with some real pension reform. I guess that means a constitutional amendment that allows the state and local governments in Illinois to reduce pension benefits. That ain't happening. There are other reforms. That's the that that is this analysis in a nutshell. I wonder if the well, let, let's talk about the reforms that, that uh, Governor Pritzker wants to bring. Governor Pritzker says we're going to have a constitutional amendment, but it's not going to be to limit pensions. He says that's an obligation we have to stay with. What the governor wants to do, and this is the other big thing that's happening this year. There's a lot, ladies and gentlemen. This is again, we said this last week one of the more significant spring sessions in a long time. So we got this capital bill of $41.5 billion. The governor's trying to get a progressive income tax going, and he says we need that to eventually put the state on a sound financial footing. Let's listen to what the governor said in March when he announced uh, the idea of having a progressive tax. This proposal keeps Illinois competitive with its neighbors. Most families in Iowa and Wisconsin pay more in income taxes under their current tax systems than they would if they lived in Illinois under our proposed tax plan. Now, there are those who want to scare people by claiming that this proposal will cause residents and businesses to flee Illinois. They couldn't be more wrong. They ignore the fact that people and businesses are fleeing our state now under our current regressive tax system. Yet states with fair tax systems on average grow faster and create more jobs than Illinois. It's time that we stabilized our state's finances so we can give businesses and new entrepreneurs the certainty that Illinois has its fiscal house in order. And so uh, we'll, we'll see if the gov if uh, Illinois can get its fiscal house in order. Jeff, uh, what's your reaction so far on to what the governor's saying and, and well, how that's going? The main problem, Terry, with the proper with the progressive income tax is it, it's a big boost in rates to people who are high income, maybe extending to the middle class, but even just to the high income people, those are job producers. And if they leave, I'll go to the jobs often. And the thing of it is, when people talk about the progressive tax, like the governor, and they say, it's not so bad, we'll still be lower after those rates are increased than our surrounding states, like Wisconsin and Michigan. That may be the case. But the important thing is, we have the highest property taxes in the country. And when people think whether they want to stay in Illinois or come to Illinois, they look at the total tax pack package. The sales tax, the property tax, the income tax per capita, and that they're going to be paying. And if it's a lot higher, that total package, that's a problem. Because in the past, at least we could say, okay, our property taxes are higher, but our income taxes are way lower. Now we can't say that, especially these high income people. You have to look at things at the margin. That's the lesson for Governor Pritzker. Well, and that's the conversation that uh, I've had uh, with people in the Capitol. And what some of these people say, you know, the conversation they're not hearing is, well, okay, so if we have this progressive tax, uh, does that mean our property taxes can go down? Do we, when do we get relief on property taxes? And at the point you made, yes, the, the governor is right that even after the increase, we're not going to be non-competitive on income taxes, but we're very non-competitive when it comes to property taxes, and that's not based on your ability to pay. 
And so that's a, a real harm that uh, does to this economy for both homeowners and businesses, businesses that might just be struggling to keep their doors open. And here they got to pay a property tax that isn't, again, isn't based on their ability to pay. Now, some of the Republicans, while well, we heard Margot McDermott say uh, that she's on board with the Capitol, and a lot of them are, uh, Senator Brady said he was also looking forward to having conversations on the Capitol bill. Let's talk to uh, the budget. As the budget comes around, and relative to the progressive tax, the Republicans are not on board, and they had a uh, press conference just yesterday as uh, Republican House Leader Jim Durkin made his comments uh, saying it's not needed. We have the money to balance the budget with no new taxes or tax increases. However, this message continues to fall on deaf ears with our colleagues on the other side of the aisle. History has shown that it does not matter how much revenue we have, but the Democrats will always find reasons to tax our Illinois families and businesses more and more. My message to the other side in the, uh, of the aisle is that it is time to rewrite history. Governor Pritzker should welcome and embrace this news by sparing Illinoisans any new taxes or tax increases. Well, here I guess what uh, Leader Jerkin is saying is that because we had this infusion of growth, of new revenue that we talked about last week, Terry, the additional $1.5 billion that came to the state because we had a, the nation had, and Illinois had a very good growth in 2018, and first quarter 2019, in April 2019, we got this additional 1.5 billion. And so what Durkin is saying, we don't need this, we certainly don't need a higher tax now. We've got our budget balance for fiscal 20 at about $40 billion, I think he's saying. <coughs> and, and, and he's not looking, I guess, ahead to 2021, 2022. And I guess he's saying, maybe it'll, will, it will be balanced. But what Leader Durkin has to do is, is sketch that out, sketch out if he thinks we won't have much growth in spending, tell us where there's going to be cuts or reforms that does that, and tell us how we live within our means without a higher tax and more revenue. His Pritzker's going to say, uh-uh, I'm looking at fiscal 2021 when we need $3.4 billion in revenue, and that's what I get from the progressive income tax. And others are saying, well, actually Pritzker's, Pritzker's promises add up to $10 billion. You got to get into that discussion. Leader Durkin has to take that on. He can't just say what he said, or he leave a you leave a cavernous opening for Pritzker and the Democrats to say Durkin, Brady, Republicans are not being realistic. We got to hear that discussion. That's my point. As we talk uh, about the tax increases, we, we can see these are some of the new taxes and fees being proposed, Jeff. And the number one on the list here is uh, the most significant. Uh, the governor in his uh, 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 capital bill is talking about increasing the uh, gas tax from the current 19 cents to 38 cents. So that's a double. And he's also going to double the fee on registering new cars from about $100 to $199. Other taxes are on liquor, gaming, video streaming, uh, cable, a lot of these things uh, in the works. They, you know, again, I'm going to remind the audience in the last two weeks here, there's a lot of things that are discussed. It's not to say that these are necessarily going to end up being like that, but that's, that's what's being proposed. And then these are going to be uh, ongoing as far as what some of the uh, discussions are are over the next two weeks, and we'll have to see how this shakes out, but that's more or less the blueprint, Jeff. And those are mostly taxes, maybe all, that relate to funding the capital bill, right? I think so. And, and the thing of it is, there's a lot in there. I mean, whether we're talking, as I said, $7 billion a year from state government taxes, $7 billion that may be collected by the state, but coming from the local governments. That's a lot of money. In Chicago, under Rahm Emanuel, we were used to being nickel and dimed, as I said, to death. You know, they didn't raise the property tax, maybe, but they raised so many other taxes, it was even worse. People are going to say, look what you're doing to us. 
you got a video gaming tax, you got a streaming tax, you got a cable tax, you got, you know, um, you got an auto registration tax, you got a gas tax. I mean, you're standing there at the pump, Terry, and I don't know whether it's going, if it was going to be $45, and is now is it going to 50, 54? This is the people in their pocketbook. Well, that, and they that's the thing. We, we talk, uh, the governor is making the point on the progressive tax that people like him should pay more money, and it's not fair that it's a regressive. The flat tax, he says, is regressive. The argument here is when you, you start doubling the gas tax, I mean, you know, People with low incomes have cars and have to drive to work, too. And you talk about a regressive tax. There you go. There's no progressivity when you start doubling the gas tax. And that's going to be hitting people. 19 cents a gallon. Well, how many how many miles uh, do you drive a year and how many miles do you get to the gallon? So that, that could uh, well be adding a lot of cost to a middle class family. And, you know, when the governor says he's going to be cutting taxes under his tax plan, the progressive tax, he's going to be cutting taxes for 97 uh, percent. If you look at those savings, technically he's cut, cutting uh, for the lower income earners in the middle class. But those savings are really very slim. I mean, in, in certain cases, we might be talking about $50 a year, $100 oh, maybe yeah, a year. But, you know, you're going to be eating up far more than those savings by doubling the gas tax. And then what, what happens if somebody wants to buy a new car? And even on the used cars, uh, just to renew that, you're going to be adding uh, over $50 on, on those. It, it, that does step down as far as the age of the car. The other thing, uh, let me bring in here quickly, uh, just as time is always our enemy. Uh, we have here the uh, new income streams also being considered. Because the state's trying to, you know, the governor's trying to do whatever he can to get some more money coming in here. Uh, so they're looking, of course, to be legalizing marijuana. They're looking at expanding sports betting. They say this, just like marijuana and sports betting, that's going on anyway behind the scenes. And we have casinos already, but they want to expand that. And some of those casinos, those licenses are in the uh, millions of dollars. So we pass that, then that's going to be quite uh, quite the expansion. Well, yeah, he's got to focus on the politics of this. The governor does, the Democrats do. They got several major projects going on here. We're talking about the progressive income tax, putting that on the ballot in 2020. We're talking about putting the higher tax rates for the higher income people on uh, passing that perhaps in this, in this legislative session, which only has two weeks left. We're talking about a major change with respect to legalizing recreational marijuana. We're talking about a major change, $42 billion in capital and a capital budget. I don't think you can do all that. I don't think so. Yeah. Maybe you get the progressive income tax. Maybe you get the capital fund. I think you have to give up on, uh, you know, uh, on legalizing marijuana recreationally. Because there's only so much you can do, and I don't even think you can pass a $42 billion capital fund budget, maybe half that. That's what I think. Well, we'll see. And uh, as we uh, tape this on the uh, 18th of May, the, uh, this is a Saturday, on Monday, uh, the House is going to be taking up the marijuana issue on a uh, informational hearing only. That means they're not going to have the bill, they're not going to be voting on the bill. But they'll have an open discussion in committee. We'll, Illinois Channel will be carrying some of that and we'll, for those who want to see what the uh, committee was talking about. But to your point, a lot of people in the Capitol think the same thing. This is kind of like uh, someone yelling fire in a theater and everyone runs to the door and not everyone can get out. You get a log jam. People are thinking we're starting to have a pretty big log jam as these major issues pile up one after another. And you just said marijuana, expanding of gaming, capital bill, a progressive income tax. How are you going to get all that done by the end of the year? Uh, marijuana is uh, maybe one of those that might have to be booted and put off until uh, the fall or maybe even next spring. It is a complex issue. Aside from the dollars, uh, they're making all kinds of uh, other changes, some of them to uh, about expunging criminal, re criminal records. And as Heather Staines, uh, Democratic senator, said in a hearing earlier this week, 
She said, you know, there's also a public health issue as far as legalizing marijuana. Let's take a listen to what she had to say earlier. They're getting. Uh, we hear stories of rat poisoning uh, from Joliet, excuse me, Peoria, uh, where people had died last summer uh, because of rat poisoning being um, included and, and cut into the cannabis. Uh, fentanyl uh, being regularly added. We just don't know what you're buying when you're buying it on the street. Well, uh, Heather, uh, Heather, Heather Staines makes a good point about this other, if you regulate something, if you make it legal, you can have more control over the quality of the stuff that's put out there than if it's illegal and it's a market. So nobody disputes that. The question is, can you do all of the things this bill does? Can you do expungement? Can you do... Uh, uh, set up a system of, of people who get licenses to sell this. Can you see that those go to the appropriate people? That's a lot to do. I know they've done a lot of work, but, and, and look at the politics. We're putting something on the ballot, like the progressive income tax, we're talking a 60% vote. So you need 71 of the 74 Democrats, assuming you don't get any Republicans. But for something like this, legalizing marijuana, and I don't know if it's how it splits, Democrat and Republican, but you only need a majority, so you only need uh, 60 Democrats, okay, to get, so that's easier, but, you know, there's a lot of law enforcement that say, although expungement sounds good, we've talked about the social justice issues of why that makes sense, there are a lot of people concerned that's going too far, and they maybe don't want to expunge as much as, as much as they're talking about doing. So the point is, there's a lot on the plate here you got to look at the politics as well as the public policy. And, you know, Madigan wants to keep those folks. He's got a large majority there. And these folks come up for re-election in the state house every two years. So they're going to have to run again through things that they're going to hurt them, whether it's higher taxes, legalizing marijuana. He's concerned. Well, let's, let's talk about the politics. And uh, we know we have overwhelming majorities in the House and the Senate of Democrats. Uh, the Democrats are supported mightily by uh, uh, the unions around the state. They're, they're the biggest backers of the Democratic Party. And uh, now that uh, we have this uh, supermajority in the House and the Senate on the Democratic side, another thing that we're hearing in the Capitol from some of the business groups is that some of these Democrats, or some of the unions rather, are going to their uh, Democratic uh, uh, policy uh, or their politicians and saying, you know, we want some favors in return. We've got some uh, policies that under Rauner were bottled up. And one of them recently uh, that we came on to was that the uh, there's an effort to say, you know, we have prevailing wage in public works. Uh, we want to have prevailing wage uh, in private works too. Uh, and we talked recently to Alicia Martin. She is the executive director of the Associated Builders of Illinois. She said that's uh, that's unseemly and, and breaks uh, traditions. Let's take a look at the comment that she had when we talked to her earlier this week. What is wrong with paying the prevailing wage? Well, there's nothing wrong with paying prevailing wage per se. I think what's wrong with the bill is the overreach of government to dictate wages on private construction work dictating a wage between two organizations that are private entities and it's setting, it's setting a bad example for down the road because where will it end? Where will that egregious overreach end? So, so Ter Terry, two major points here. Uh, as Alicia is saying, you know, you're expanding something. Uh, when she says there's no major problem with prevailing wages, a lot of people would disagree. Whether it's government or private, a lot of people would say that means higher union wages, that means more unemployment which especially hits minorities. There is another point of view there. And, uh, but, but it becomes even more important, which is her point, when you're extending this control, this power of government now to private sector projects. And just briefly, data centers, data centers are all over Illinois. It's an enterprise that's actually been doing quite well, but now unions are saying they wanna have more restrictions on these private data centers, similar in terms of whether it has to be, they have people have to be hiring with unionized labor, whether they have to have project labor agreements, and there may be a deal in the works. We'll find out more about that. So we're seeing this clash of union power, and the question is, are the Republicans gonna stand up or are they gonna make a deal? And I think we brought something to people's attention that they're gonna see covered and perhaps resolved in the next two weeks. 
Yeah, and and with all these major issues, as we've talked about over the top of the show, you have some of these issues like here that are not, like Alicia Martin was talking about, they're not of the same caliber as changing the Constitution for a progressive tax or passing a $41 billion capital bill, but they're very important for a lot of industries across the state, and sometimes we just don't get enough coverage. That's why we want to make sure we brought that up. Another key thing uh, that's happening here, also very important, is uh, DCFS, Department of Children and Family Services. That has been a disaster of an agency. Over the last six years, they've had something like seven executive directors, more or less, just to give people an idea. It's been a revolving door in leadership. Uh, and just over the last year, we've had at least two children famously uh, die that were supposed to be care. A lot of complaints about uh, reports of the caseworkers being overwhelmed and not being able to keep up. Uh, Governor Pritzker announced that he was focusing also on restructuring DCFS so that those uh, tragedies could be avoided going forward. Let's listen to what the governor told the media just earlier this week. Let's bring transparency. Let's make sure that we're addressing each one of the challenges that you raised, that we have new caseworkers, that we have better training, that we have uh, that we fill the positions that are available, uh, and that we're actually addressing, starting with the most vulnerable cases, uh, so that we can protect our children. Look, there's a lot of work to do here. There's no doubt about it. And this isn't, as I said earlier, this is not something that is going to happen overnight. We're not going to fix it overnight. What we can do is start with the things that are most urgent and make sure, and I say this about lots of things across state government, that you know we have short-term, medium-term, and long-term challenges that we have to overcome, but we can't wait for the medium-term challenges and long-term challenges to start addressing. We have to start addressing all three of those categories on day one, because they're medium-term because they take time, and long-term because they take time, but you have to start now. So You gotta start Governor's now. Right. Governor's right, we gotta triage that. We got to go to the most pressing problems. Representative Feigenholz, Feigenholz is making a case that we've not been increasing money. We need to spend more. Possibly, I say again to the governor, to the representative, where are the reforms? The answer can't, can't always be spending more money. And something has to be done. They're right to address it, but you need reforms as well as perhaps spending some more money. Jeff, I'll, I'll admit to you in the audience, we're trying to cram a lot in because a lot's happening, and this always happens when you come down to two weeks. So the governor, to his credit, is trying to get a handle on that DCFS to save lives of children. Other people are saying, you know, we need to save the lives of children when it comes to abortion, and that Illinois is moving in the wrong direction of the country, that there are bills out there to liberalize abortion in Illinois, when just this past week we've had Georgia change its rules to uh, abortion rules to make it more restrictive, and just yesterday Missouri also passed a more restrictive abortion bill called the Heartbeat Bill that prohibits abortions after eight weeks in Missouri. Earlier this year, uh, Cardinal Kupich of uh, Chicago spoke about the liberalization effort and condemned it. Let's listen to the comments that he had to say a few weeks ago. This morning, I come to question the unlimited right of one human being to end the life of another. The so-named Reproductive Health Care Act, Health, Health Act, Health Care Act, embodied in House Bill 2495 and Senate Bill 1942, calls for a complete overhaul of the state's abortion laws, stripping the unborn child of any rights. This legislation states that, quote, a fertilized egg, embryo, or fetus does not have any rights under the laws of the state. Further, the legislation removes the right of health care workers to refuse to participate in a procedure that violates their right of conscience. Does the state of Illinois really want to become a place where people are forced to do things in their workplace that are against their most deeply held beliefs? Another bill, before our legislators, removes the parental notification law for minors seeking abortion. The current parental notification requirement can be waived 
if a court finds a minor sufficiently mature and well enough informed to decide to have an abortion. In fact, this override has been granted in hundreds of cases. Again, we have a solution in search of a problem. Well, this is a national issue. People are saying states like uh, Georgia and Missouri and so forth really, really cutting back on what people might call the right to have an abortion, the right of choice. And now we see Illinois perhaps cutting back eat, uh, quite a bit on, on the rights of the unborn. So in both instances, are they going too far? People will be debating that nationally, and they'll be debating that, uh, and they'll be debating that here in Illinois. But parental notice, right of conscience for people not to be involved in procedures that go against their, their right of conscience, taking away completely the rights of the unborn, major changes. This ought to be debated, thought through, and uh, I'm sure, I'm sure it will if there are going to be changes that will be debated in the next two weeks. And we're going to look forward to seeing everybody come back next week when we're, we'll only have a week left to see how this stuff is getting resolved. And people want to keep focusing on the end of the legislative session, what will happen in your pocketbook, what will happen in social issues, what will happen. They'll find it all out here on Illinois Channel and Public Affairs.